Okay, super excited now to talk about the nervous system, chapter 13. You're going to be revisiting this again next semester with pharmacology. And it's really important that you understand how the nervous system works for a lot of different reasons because it's really a big part of how the body works, how diseases affect the body, and how pharmaceuticals can affect the body as well. We're going to begin by talking about the learning objectives, which are um, to describe the structures and functions, not in great detail, um, but in general, of the neurons and neuroglia of the cerebrum, the cerebellum, the diencephalon, and the brainstem. And they're just four different areas of the brain we'll talk about. We're going to differentiate between white matter and gray matter, the functions of afferent versus efferent nerves, the components of the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system, the difference between those two. We're going to differentiate between autonomic and somatic nervous systems, one you control and one you don't. We'll describe the process of depolarization and repolarization of neurons, how they fire. Also, the excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmitters and describe their role in conduction of nerve impulses. We're going to talk about the connective tissue layers that surround the brain and spinal cord. We'll explain the function of the cerebrospinal fluid. We'll list the cranial nerves. And here's where memorization comes in. You need to understand the cranial nerves and describe their basic functions. We'll also differentiate between sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems and between autonomic and somatic reflexes. We'll describe the components of a reflex arc and explain explain the role of each of those components. We'll also describe the stretch reflex, stretch and relax or contract, withdrawal reflex, the crossed extensor reflex, the palpebral reflex, and the pupillary light reflex, among some others. So neurons are the basic functional units of the nervous system. They are the cell, the nerve cell. Neurons have a high requirement for oxygen they cannot reproduce themselves, but they can regenerate cell processes if the cell body remains intact. Neuroglia, or glial cells, provide structural and functional support to, to, and protection to those neurons. The neuron structure. There is a central cell body, or soma. Soma means body. And it's also called a perikaryon, just a different word for it. Within that cell body, there is a nucleus. It's the brain center of the cell, it provides energy for the cell. Then we have for this neuron a cell processes. The dendrites receive stimuli. The dendrites are like the branches and leaves of a tree receiving sunlight. The axons are like the root of the tree or the plant. They're conducti conducting nerve impulses away from the, de from the nerve cell. So dendrites accept the nerve impulses, the stimuli, and axons carry those nerve impulses away. At the end of the axons, there are little knobs um, or little branches. These branches are called telodendra, ten telodendron. And then there are little knobs at the end of those branches called synaptic knobs. So the dendrites, here they are at the top. They receive stimuli from other neurons and conduct stimuli to the cell body. And they serve as sensory receptors for heat, cold, touch, pressure, stretch, or any other physical changes from inside or outside of the body. They are short, they're numerous, and they are multi-branched. Axons conduct nerve impulses away from the cell toward another neuron or an effector cell, a cell that, uh, that affects a, a response. They are a single long process and they may be covered with myelin. Myelin is this covering here made up of a, um, made by Schwann cells that cre uh, creates this myelin sheath, a protective coating. White matter is tissue that contains myelinated axons. So that's the definition of white matter. Any tissue that contains these axons that are myelinated. Myelinated axons conduct impulses faster than unmyelinated ones. So because of these, this coating that actually helps the nerve impulse to conduct much faster. The, the reason for that will be explained in a minute. 
the myelin sheath is a cell membrane of glial cells. Remember those glial cells are what support and protect the, the uh, neuron. And they're tightly wrapped around the axon. Now, when these um, glial cells are within the brain and the spinal cord, they are called oligodendrocytes. So within the sprain or spinal, spinal brain or spinal cord, they're called oligodendrocytes, and that's the central nervous system. If they're outside the central nervous system, they're called Schwann cells. So any nerves that are covered with a myelin sheath outside the brain and spinal cord, outside the central nervous system, are called Schwann cells. One way to remember that is if you've ever seen this truck driving around delivering outside, um, this is a Schwann delivery system. Uh, um, and it is uh, protecting this, the, the nerve ice cream inside the truck. Um, so you can think of it that way. So Schwann cells out protect the neuron outside of the central nervous system. All right, axons have multiple Schwann cells or oligodendrocytes, which cover the entire length of the axon. And this is where it gets interesting because this is how things move faster on these covered cells, these covered axons. That's because we have in between these individual cells, we have these little gaps. These gaps are called the node of Ron VA, and they're gaps between adjacent glial cells. And what happens is within these gaps, because we have these little gaps here, the impulse, instead of traveling down the um, nerve fiber like this, it actually jumps from point to point nerve impulse jumps from point to point. So kind of plays leapfrog from here to here instead of traveling down the road. A little bit of a shortcut. All right, organization. So anatomically, we have our central nervous system, brain and spinal cord, or sprain and vinyl cord, however you want to say it. We also have our peripheral nervous system, which extends outward from the central axis, your brain and spinal cord, toward the periphery of the body. Now, part of this peripheral nervous system are the cranial nerves. And those cranial nerves originate directly from the brain. The spinal nerves emerge from the spinal cord. Makes sense, doesn't it? The direction of impulses. This is where we talk about afferent or efferent nerves. Afferent nerves conduct impulses toward the CNS. So they're very, let's say, think, think of them as uh, being very um, affectionate. Okay, so it starts the same way. Afferent nerves come toward the CNS. They're also called sensory nerves. That's a little easier to remember. Sensory nerves, afferent nerves, same thing. They conduct sensations from the sensory receptors in the skin, those dendrites that receive the stimulation, and other locations in the body and take it to the CNS. Efferent nerves conduct impulses away from the CNS. They are making an effect. So instead of being affectionate, affectionate and going towards the CNS, they are making an effect away from the CNS or exiting the CNS. These are also called motor nerves. They cause skeletal muscle contraction and movement. Cranial and spinal nerves in the peripheral nervous system and the nerve tracts or bundle of accents, axons in the central nervous system can carry nerve fibers that are either afferent or sensory or motor efferent or both sensory and motor. The uh, further organization, they have, we have a function. So the autonomic nervous system versus somatic nervous system. The somatic nervous system are actions that are under conscious or voluntary control. So think of somatic as the body. You control your body. That is conscious, that is voluntary, that's the somatic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system controls and coordinates automatic functions. So autonomic, automatic. Example slowing of the heart rate in response to an increased blood pressure. You don't necessarily control that. There, that. That is an automatic thing that happens within your body to maintain homeostasis. Resting state is when a neuron is not being stimulated. There is also something called resting membrane potential. This is when there is a difference in the electrical charge between, across that neuronal membrane. So across that nerve cell membrane, there's a difference in ions. And it's the result from the differences in the distribution of the positive and negative charges from sodium, potassium, protons, or proteins, and other charged ions on either side of the neuronal membrane. So we have that difference 
It's a resting membrane potential. It wants to fire. It just needs the proper stimulus. So in order to keep this in a, in a resting state, to maintain the cell in the resting state, we have this thing called a sodium-potassium pump. It pumps sodium from the inside of the neuron to the outside. And it pumps potassium from the outside of the neuron to the inside. And it does this just normal. This is the sodium-potassium pump. is kind of like the bouncer at a party. It's normally wanting to allow three sodium in for every two potassium that um, come out. So it's keeping the, the party going, but it's not allowing it to create a, a major issue. Now, if something stimulates the neuron, the bouncer uh, gets distracted by the stimulus. And so the sodium channel opens up on the neuron cell membrane. That bouncer is no longer working, doing his job. And the sodium ions just rush into that party, rush into that uh, cell by passive diffusion. So that creates an action potential. During depolarization, the inside of the neuron goes from a negatively charged cell, because remember the bouncer is keeping all the negatives or negatives inside the party. Um, and and it, so we have a negatively charged resting membrane potential. And then it becomes a positive charge because we have an inflow of sodium ions ready to party. This creates a large change in electrical charge from negative to positive. With repolarization, so that's depolarization, with repolarization, the sodium channel is closed. The bouncer pays attention, says, whoa, 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 let's close it. And in order to change, uh, to, to reset that um, party a little bit, the potassium channels will open and potassium will diffuse out of the cell. There's, there's too much positivity going on in there. Potassium needs to leave in order to re reduce that uh, amount and get back to the resting state. And as that repolarization ends, we get the sodium out, um, we get the sodium potassium, or I'm sorry, we get the potassium out, the sodium potassium pump starts working again, that bouncer starts working again, and moves the sodium and potassium ions back to the original sides, and we get a resting state. Everything in the party is going wonderfully, there's no craziness, there's no stimulus. There is a threshold stimulus, um, the stimulus that, that uh, comes to the cell needs to be sufficient to make the neuron respond and cause complete depolarization. So if we think back to the model of the bouncer, that you need a stimulus that is strong enough to distract that bouncer. Um, if it's not strong enough, you're not going to get a complete depolarization. But once, once that bouncer is distracted, it is fully distracted. It is an all or nothing principle, and that those sodium channels will open up and the doors open up, and you will get that sodium influx to the, the, the biggest potential. That neuron depolarizes to its maximum strength or not at all. Conduction of the action potential is a spreading wave of opening sodium channels down along those nerve um, or the, the cell membrane um, in sufficient numbers to allow sodium influx and depolarization of that cell. It's that wave of depolarization or nerve impulse that carries that stimulus down the length of the axon. There is a refractory period, so there is a time during which a neuron is insensitive to any additional stimuli. You can only distract the bouncer sufficiently one time. And so when the cell is actually still in the depolarization or early repolarization uh, period, that, that bouncer is, is still distracted. There's nothing more you can further distract the bouncer or open up more doors to get more sodium in. There is also, there, there are two parts of this refractory period though. There's an absolute refractory period during which sodium influx, um, you've got sodium rushing into the cell and potassium is slowly moving out of the cell. But then there's also a relative refractory period at the end of the repolarization period that if you simulate it enough, you can, you can get another depolarization. So it's an all or nothing um, prospect but there is a point at which enough of this so of potassium has left the cell. Um, we don't have uh, we don't have completely back to a resting mem membrane potential, but we have relative change in the the positive to negative, so that we can cause another reaction that will cause another switch in in the uh, positive negative sides of the cell. All right, here's our saltatory conduction, our leapfrogging, which is that rapid means of conducting an action potential um, because we have these myelinated sheaths with the nodes of Ranvier in between them. 
Um, it, depolarization in the myelinated axons only take place at the nodes of RNVA, so that doesn't happen do, 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 along this cell. It happens here, and it happens here, and it happens here, and it happens here. So it skips all the in, inside stuff. It's kind of like the um, cliff notes, okay? So you skip all the meaty stuff in the middle, but you get the general idea. You move from one point to the next point to the next point. Synaptic transmission is when you have a synapse. You have a junction between two individual neurons or a neuron and a target cell. There is a synaptic cleft. If you remember in our muscle lecture, we have a synapse from the nerve to the muscle, and there's a, a space in between the nerve and the muscle, or in this case, synaptic cleft is between two adjacent neurons. Um, so there's space in there where a chemical messenger goes across uh, that space. So it turns from a, an electrical impulse to a chemical impulse. The presynaptic neuron is that neuron that brings the depolarization wave to that synapse. It's the one that releases that neurotransmitter. And then the postsynaptic neuron it contains receptors for that neuro neurotransmitter. That neurotransmitter then affects another um, uh, change in, in the electrical charge and causes this depolarization of that next neuron. There at that at that telodendron, remember those little synaptic bulbs at the end of the um, axons. We've got telodendron that branch structure on the presynaptic neuron on those axons with a terminal bouton or button, um, which is an, a slightly enlarged bulb on the end of this telodendron. It's called a synaptic end bulb, and it's also called a synaptic knob. There are vesicles within that knob that contain the neurotransmitter, little sacs um, that have um, whatever the neurotransmitter is. And there are lots of little neurotransmitters. It, it depends on the nerve. It could have many different types of neurotransmitters or one type of neurotransmitter. When the depolarization wave reaches that synaptic knob, vesicles fuse with the knob's cellular membrane and dump that neurotransmitter, that chemical, into the synaptic cleft. On this postsynaptic uh, membrane, there are receptor molecules specific for these neurotransmitters. There are ways to affect how things are released and how things are received by using medications. And so this is uh, a really important point to understand, um, not only how the body works, but how we can adjust how the body works as well. So these neurotransmitters are diffusing across that synaptic the cleft through toward the postsynaptic membrane, the receptors on the postsynaptic mem membrane bind to the neurotransmitter. There are different types of neurotransmitters. There are excitatory neurotransmitters, which um, cause an influx of the sodium so that the postsynaptic membrane moves toward that threshold and fires. Then we also have inhibitory neurotransmitters, which move the charge within the postsynaptic cell farther away from the threshold where we will get the nerve to fiber. So either the neurotransmitter will excite the nerve and get it to fire, or it will inhibit the nerve and keep it from firing. So some types that we see are acetylcholine, and these can be either excitatory or inhibitory. It depends on its location in the body, and it depends on what receptors take it in. Catecholamines, norepinephrine and epinephrine, are associated with fight or flight reactions of the sympathetic nervous system. There's also dopamine, which is a catecholamine. It's involved with autonomic functions and muscle control as well. There's also gamma aminobutyric acid, which is a GABA um, and, it, uh, and glycine, and it is inhibitory. So these are just some examples of ones that we will come across. And I mentioned acetylcholine because we use that uh, acetylcholine um, frequently when we describe medications and different things happening in the body. We also describe norepinephrine and epinephrine, dopamine, so serotonin is a neuro neurotransmitter as well. You may have heard of serotonin, but there are many of these, but these are the, the main ones that we'll talk about. We need to, once we have um, had this neurotransmitter go across that synaptic uh, bulb, we need to break it down so it can come across that synaptic cleft, come back to the uh, presynaptic membrane. Uh, one is called acetylcholinesterase, and if you can guess pretty well, you'll understand that it breaks down acetylcholine. It erases acetylcholine. We also have monoamine oxidase, or MAO. That one breaks down norepinephrine. Now, I do want you to remember these things because 
um, uh, it becomes important later. MAO is a, if we can inhibit it, we call that an MAO inhibitor. And if you look at different medications, you will see that certain medications can't be taken with things called MAOIs or MAO inhibitors. Just listen to some commercials. You'll hear it uh, frequently. And now you can say, hey, I know what that does. Monoamine oxidase breaks down norepinephrine. Catecholamethyltransferase, or COM-T, breaks down norepinephrine that is not reabsorbed. Um, so it's a different way of breaking down norepinephrine. The central nervous system consists of the cerebrum, the brain, the cerebrum, the cerebellum back here, and this helps to control our, um, our coordinated movements. The diencephalon, which is in the center within the um, brain, and it, that contains the thalamus and the hypothalamus. And if you think about endocrine, we uh, can remember that the hypothalamus controls much of the endocrine system within the body. So that is within the diencephalon. And then we have our brain stem. Our brain stem has the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. And these are really important for our autonomic nervous system. They help to control um, respirations, heartbeat, that kind of thing. So kind of important. And then we have our spinal cord. The cerebrum consists of both gray matter and uh, white matter. Gray matter is part of the cerebral cortex at the outer layer of the brain. That's where higher function occurs, thinking, logic, um, that kind of thing. White matter are the fibers beneath the cortex and the corpus callosum. And the corpus callosum is where fibers connect two halves of the cerebral cortex. I'll give you a little um, understanding here about that corpus callosum. The stronger the connections between the right and left half of the brains, the more flexible your brain is in learning um, and in healing as well. Uh, it, it does tend to be a little bit uh, more connected in females versus males. And that kind of explains why women can maybe multitask a little bit more. There is an area of the brain that's responsible for higher order behaviors, the cerebrum, um, learning, intelligence, awareness, etc. Looking at the cerebrum, there are several different structures that we will want to recognize. A gyri or gyrus um, are, are the folds in the cerebral hemisphere. So hemisphere would be a half of the brain, and these are the folds within the brain. Fissures are deep grooves that separate the gyri. So there's a longitudinal fissure, and there are um, transverse, uh, there's a transverse fissure as well. And it's not really seen here, but we have folds within increasing the surface area of the brain. There are also sulci, which are shallow grooves separating the gyri, and it um, will help to divide the cerebral hemisphere into different lobes. This longitudinal fissure is that prominent groove that divides the right and left cerebral hemispheres, and it's in between them that we see the corpus callosum, or those fibers that connect the two halves. So here are the lobes, and these are divided by sulci, right? So frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe, and temporal lobe. The cerebellum is located just behind the cerebrum, and it's the area of the brain responsible for coordinated movement, balanced posture, and complex reflexes. If we have a, a smaller than normal cere cerebellum, we will have uncoordinated movements. The diencephalon is a passageway between the brainstem and the cerebrum. There are structures associated with the diencephalon that are the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the pituitary. The thalamus acts as a relay station for regulating sensory inputs into the cerebrum. So it is a relay station between the spinal cord and input into the cerebrum. Uh, the hypothalamus is the interface between the nervous system and the endocrine system, and the pituitary is the master gland of the endocrine system. The brainstem is the connection between the, re the rest of the brain and the spinal cord. It's composed of the medulla oblongata, um, and it, I don't know if you remember the movie Waterboy, but this is a link to that movie where they discuss the medulla oblongata. Um, and I will put that link for you just for fun in the eLearn course shell. There's also the pons and the midbrain. The area of the brain responsible for basic support of the functions, uh, basic support functions of the body. So if we unhook the brainstem, the body does not function. 
Many of the cranial nerves originate from this area of the brain. It's a very, very important part of the brain. Meninges. These are the connective tissue layers that surround the brain and the spinal cord. You may have heard of a disease called meningoencephalitis. That would be inflammation of the structures of the brain and the covering of the brain. The meninges contain blood vessels, fluid, and fat, and they supply nutrients and oxygen to the superficial tissues of the brain and the spinal cord. They also provide some cushioning and distribution of nutrients for the CNS. There are three layers of meninges. There's the dura matter, which is tough, dura, durable, right? Tough and fibrous. When we talk about doing a, uh, a spinal uh, tap or a um, putting medicine within the spinal cord, this is something that you can do. When you do it and you put it in the right place, you actually feel a real pop when you put the, the needle through. It's a very, it's a tough fibrous material, you actually feel it. That dura matter covers the subdural space. It is the first layer you come to. The next one is the arachnoid meninges. And this is a delicate spider web like um, layer. Uh, it doesn't really provide a lot of support, but it does have some structural to, to keep a space between the dura matter and the pia mater. The pia mater is very thin. It lies directly on the surface of the brain and spinal cord. Obviously, when we are placing medicine into the spinal cord, and this is the brain, because you can see bone, dura mater, arachnoid, uh, subarachnoid, and pia mater, um, and the brain. Uh, but the similar thing with the spinal cord. When we're putting a substance in, we're generally putting it into this arachnoid um, uh, or within the subarachnoid space, if you go a little deeper, or just below the dura mater, so it will infuse on top of this pia mater. So the fluid, it lies between the layers of the meninges in the canals and ventricles inside the brain, so there's little spaces within the brain as well, um, and the central canal of the spinal cord. This provides a cushioning function. It also may play a role in regulation of some of the autonomic functions, such as respiration and vomiting. If you get um, an increase in pressure in your head because you have too much cerebrospinal fluid within the cavities uh, within your head, it will stretch those meninges and it will cause some problems like decreased respiration and vomiting. Um, if you've ever been hit on the head, one of the side effects can be that you vomit uh, with a concussion. Um, so you'll know what I'm talking about. The blood-brain barrier separates the capillaries in the brain from nervous tissue. This is one way to protect this very um, sensitive nervous tissue. The capillary walls in the brain have no fenestrations. They have no windows, no holes like other capillary walls do throughout the rest of the body um, because they are covered by the cell membranes of the glial cells. The glial cells help to protect those, that very sensitive nerve tissue within the brain. This prevents many drugs, proteins, ions and other molecules from readily passing from the breath, passing from the blood into the brain. There are some breeds that have a leaky blood brain barrier. That means the glial cells are not completely formed uh, in this area. And so that makes uh, it more easy for drugs and some other things to pass that blood brain barrier. Um, it makes them a little more susceptible to certain things. Um, I'm wondering if you know of any Breeds that might have this. And if you've worked within the um, veterinary world, you know that herding dogs, do sheep dogs, um, border collies, uh, shelties, those type of dogs actually have a leaky blood brain barrier, or most of them, and that creates problems when we give them certain medications. There are certain heartworm medications we cannot give them because it affects their nervous system. All right, here we are, cranial nerves. This is something I want you to know. I want you to know it well because we not only are we going to test you on this, I guarantee you there will be a, a question or two about cranial nerves or surrounding cranial nerves on your exam. There are 12 nerve pairs in the peripheral nervous system that originate directly from the brain. They, that's why we call them cranial nerves. They're numbered in Roman numerals from 1 through 12. Here is the number, 
uh, in Roman numerals. Okay, so one is the olfactory nerve. It creates, a, it's a sensory nerve, so only afferent uh, fibers. And it, it uh, key function is smell. Number two is the optic nerve. Again, sensory fibers, vision. Number three, oculomotor, motor fibers, efferent fibers only, eye movement, pupil size, and focusing the lens. Number four, trochlear, also only motor, eye movement. So two eye movements here so far. Number five is the trigeminal. It has both sensory and motor, and it takes sensations from the head and teeth, and it helps with chewing. That's motor. Um, so both sensory and motor for that one. Um, number six is the abducent nerve, and it is only motor eye movement. Number seven is the facial nerve, and it has both sensory and motor neurons. It ha helps with face and scalp movement, salivation, tears, and taste. That's the sensory part. Vestibulocochlear. This is number eight. Vestibulocochlear refers to uh, the ear. A vestibular system, the cochlear system within the ear. This is all sensory. It has to do with balance and hearing. Number nine is glossopharyngeal, both sensory and motor functions. Uh, it helps with tongue movement, swallowing, salivation, and again with taste. The vagus nerve, number 10, it's our most famous one because it goes throughout the body. We also call it the wanderer. It's both sensory and motor. It does a lot. It has the sensory from the gastrointestinal tract and respiratory tree, motor to the larynx, the pharynx, parasympathetic, motor to the abdominal and thoracic organs. Then we have the accessory, which is number 11. It's um, motor, and it is the accessory to the vagus, head, both head movement motor and then accessory motor with the vagus. And finally, number 12 is the hypoglossal. Glossal means tongue, so you might be able to guess that that um, is involved with tongue movement. It's a motor nerve with tongue movement. So you can break these up into different groups to help you remember based on whether they're sensory only, motor only, or both sensory and motor, based on what they do, what their key functions are, or just straight memorize them, number, name, type, and function. Okay, so here it is again, a little bit bigger, so you can stop, pause, and write this down, make those connections. All right, spinal cord. We're going to talk about the medulla. This is the central part of the spinal cord. It's the first part of the spinal, uh, or I'm sorry. It is within this, the, the main body of the spinal cord. This is gray matter. It, the central canal is the center of the medulla. So there is a canal in which CNS fluid CN, uh, can travel. It also travels around the spinal cord. White matter lies around the outside of the spinal cord. And remember, what is white matter? It's basically made up of glial cells. The cortex is what we call the white matter. It's the outer part of the spinal cord. It surrounds that gray matter. See that butterfly appearance? That's very normal for the, the appearance of a cross section of the spinal cord. Now, coming off of this spinal cord, we have um, nerve roots. We have the one on top, which is the dorsal nerve root. We also have the ventral nerve root, and that will come uh, together to um, make one spinal nerve coming off the left and right sides of the um, spinal column, and that comes off in between the vertebrae. So dorsal and ventral nerve right roots merge from between each pair of adjacent vertebrae, Dorsal nerve roots contain sensory fibers, and the ventral nerve roots contain motor fibers. We come together, for, you have sensory and motor. Dorsal horns are the neurons in gray matter that forward sensory nerve impulses to the brain or other parts of the spinal cord. So the dorsal horns, we have sensory, goes back to the brain or to other parts of the spinal cord. The ventral horns, or those are neurons in the gray matter that forward motor or efferent nerve impulses to the spinal nerves. So the ventral horns are heading out and the dorsal horns are heading in. The autonomic nervous system is what controls automatic functions at a subconscious level. We have two systems within the autonomic nervous system. They are the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system nerves 
emerge from the thorax and lumbar vertebral regions, the thoracolumbar system. So they come from the center of your body, sympathetic from the center. Parasympathetic come from the ends of your body. So nerves emerge from the brain and the sacral vertebral regions, from the head and the sacrum. So para on the outside of your body, uh, sympathetic within the center of your body. All right, so this is how it looks. Parasympathetic in blue, head and tail, sacrum, okay? And the sympathetic is in the center, in the thoracolumbar region. This shows you what the parasympathetic nervous system is in charge of. Eye, tear glands, other glands um, of the head, heart, lungs, and bronchioles, abdominal viscera, um, and uh, some parts of the urogenital organs, okay, and large intestine. With the sympathetic nervous system, they are also part of the some somewhat of the urogenital organs and in large intestine, particularly the bladder, uh, and then eyes, ear, tear glands, salivary glands, heart, lungs, bronchioles, liver, uh, the uh, kidneys, large intestines, and stomach and small intestine. Now the difference also, and we'll talk about this in just in a minute, is that there are fibers that run directly from the brain or the spinal cord to the target organ. In some cases, they go, there is a long presynaptic fiber that goes directly to the organ. That happens on the parasympathetic side. But on the sympathetic side, there is this whole ganglionic chain that lies beside the spinal column. And there, the presynaptic uh, neurons are short, and the postsynaptic neurons that take the, um, uh, the information to or from the organs is much longer. So sympathetic, parasympathetic systems, what are the difference? The efferent motor neurons are composed of a sequence of two neurons in actually both of them. There's the preganglionic neuron, that's the cell body in the brain or the spinal cord with the axon that extends out to an autonomic automatic ganglion. It synapses with one or more additional neurons. Uh, those neurons are called postganglionic. They are after the ganglion and then are connected to the target organ. With a sympathetic chain, that's the one on the right, the sympathetic ganglion chain has a, that has a series of autonomic ganglia just outside that thoracic thoracolumbar area of the spinal column. So it's within your chest and abdominal area. Okay, here it is again. Within your chest and abdominal area, you have this ganglionic chain on the sympathetic side. So with the presympathetic or the sympathetic preganglion neuron, it's got a couple of choices. It could synapse with a neuron within the ganglion chain. It could pass through the ganglion chain and synapse with a neuron located beyond the sympathetic chain. But it usually synapses with many postganglionic neurons in the sympathetic chain or with ganglions outside the sympathetic chain. So either one. Sympathetic postganglionic neuron, this is the part to remember, is much longer than its corresponding preganglionic neuron. It doesn't take much time to get to that ganglionic chain and then depending on where it needs to go from there, it takes a lot longer. All right, so back to this, short preganglionic, long postganglionic. On the parasympathetic side, that's the left side of that picture, the neuron travels directly from the CNS to the target organ. It synapses with a very short postganglionic neuron that's in the target organ. The parasympathetic preganglionic neuron is relatively long when you compare it with a very short postganglionic neuron. Here are the effects of sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. And this is something that you do need to remember. The sympathetic system affects um, with heart rate, and think about fight or flight, okay? What needs to happen? Heart rate, force of heart contraction, diameter of bronchioles, and diameter of pupil will all increase with a sympathetic nervous system. And when we're talking about increasing with bronchioles or pupil, that means they increase in size, they dilate, they get bigger. That means you can breathe better, you can see better. With uh, the sympathetic nervous system on gastrointestinal motility, secretions, and blood flow, or digestive processes, um, with diameter of the skin, blood vessels, and the diameter of the blood vessels to the kidney, these all decrease. But the diameter of muscle blood vessels increase. We want to get more blood to the muscles, 
less blood to other organs. Makes sense. You're fighting or you're flighting. This is where you need your strength. With a parasympathetic system, the effect is to decrease the heart rate. It doesn't really have a significant effect on the force of the heart contraction. We have um, constriction of the bronchioles. You don't need to breathe as well. And constriction of the pupil. You don't need to see as well. You're resting. You're digesting. Um, but on this other side, it increases gastrointestinal motility, secretions, and blood flow. Has no significant effect on the blood vessels of the rest of the body. The primary neurotransmitter of the sympathetic nervous system is norepinephrine. So we talk about epinephrine, norepinephrine, somewhat in interchangeably. Um, it's actually norepinephrine that is the primary neurotransmitter. Uh, we talk about epinephrine um, more frequently because we actually use it in medicine. These are called adrenergic neurons. Think of the adrenal system, adrenal gland. Um, when you get your adrenaline going, what is happening? You are fighting or you're flying, right? So these are called adrenergic neurons. These are neurons that release norepinephrine. Um, no, uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine are also released from the adrenal medulla. Neurotransmitters and receptors, there are blood vessels in the skin, GI tract, and skeletal muscle that have adrenergic, we also call these catecholamines, right? Adrenergic receptors, and these respond to epinephrine or norepinephrine. These receptors, there are three. They're called alpha-1, beta-1, and beta-2. Alpha-1 adrenergic receptors cause vasoconstriction of the skin, GI tract, and kidney blood vessels. Beta-1 adrenergic receptors increase heart rate and force a contraction. Beta-2 adrenergic receptors only do one thing. They cause bronchodilation. So really, if you can remember beta-2, because it causes bronchodilation, makes it easier to try to differentiate between alpha-1 and beta-1. So think of beta-1 as affecting the heart, beta-2 as affecting the lungs, and alpha-1 does everything else. The primary neurotransmitter of the parasympathetic nervous system is acetylcholine. We call these cholinergic neurons as opposed to adrenergic neurons. These are the neurons that release acetylcholine. There are two receptors for acetylcholine. There are, there are nicotinic acetylcholine receptors on the postganglionic neurons of sympathetic and parasympathetic systems. So we call this a parasympathetic neurotransmitter, but it also actually affects the sympathetic side as well. And um, it's in between the motor neurons and the muscle. There are also muscarinic acetylcholine receptors, which are on target organs and tissues supplied by the postganglionic neuron of the parasympathetic nervous system. So nicotinic acetylcholine receptors go between both sympathetic and parasympathetic side. The muscarinic are just for the parasympathetic nervous system. So in summary, we have our autonomic or automatic nervous system. It's separated into sympathetic and parasympathetic side. On the sympathetic side, we have neurotransmitters. Um, we have norepinephrine and adrenergic receptors. The adrenergic receptors are uh, alpha-1, beta-1, and beta-2. And the neurotransmitters on the sympathetic side are epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, that kind of thing. Parasympathetic side, we have acetylcholine. That is our main um, neurotransmitter. And so it goes to um, cholinergic receptors, which are nicotinic and muscarinic. And again, nicotinic is kind of on the sympathetic side too. So don't get confused. You can separate it this clearly. Reflexes. What makes reflexes happen? Well, there are several different types of reflexes. There are somatic reflexes, which involve contraction of skeletal muscle. Somatic means body, skeletal muscle. Autonomic reflexes, so they're automatic. They regulate smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and endocrine glands. You don't have control. There are contralateral reflex, which is a reflex that starts on one side of the body and travels to the opposite side. Let me give you an example. The pupillary light reflex. When you shine a light into one eye, the opposite eye uh, pupil will contract as well. That is a contralateral reflex. An ipsilateral reflex is, this, is when you have a stimulus and response that are on the same side of the body. So an, um, an example of that would be if you uh, stimulate my patellar reflex, I will only kick you with that leg. So that's ipsilateral. The reflex arc, how does that happen? 
First of all, you need a sensory receptor. That sensory receptor receives the stimulus, so that force, and sends an action potential along the sensory neuron to the gray matter of the spinal cord or brainstem. So it goes to the gray matter along the dorsal nerve root, right? Then that sensory neuron synapses with other neurons, incoming sensory impulse that is integrated with other impulses from other sensory neurons taking in all the information. You get an integrated response of the reflex sent out by the motor neuron through the ventral, right, For, through the ventral process, um, which ends at that target organ. So you hit my knee, it's going to go up through the dorsal horn and connect with the brain. Um, if there is a connection, there's a realization, a perception within the brain, but very often those the somatic reflex arc is there's no conscious, I'm going to kick my leg out now. You have an automatic motor neuron reflex kicking that leg out. So this is a monosynaptic reflex arc. It involves a sensory neuron and a motor neuron with one synapse between them, no other interneurons, okay? So here's an example. We have an effector that contracts the extensor muscle of the leg. There, and there's a receptor in here, um, which is part of the muscle spindle, which sends information that we have contraction of this muscle. That sensory motor goes up, synapses uh, with a motor neuron, and the antagonistic muscle will relax on the other side of the leg. So I'm going to contract my bicep, for instance. Okay. That's my agonist, right? I'm going to contract that muscle, the prime mover. And as I do so, I have a monosynaptic reflex arc that is relaxing at the same time my triceps muscle, my antagonist. That is a monosynaptic reflex arc. Don't even have to think about it. There's also the withdrawal reflex. This is called a flexor reflex. And it involves several interneuron synapses. This results in contraction or flexing of muscles. Um, and for instance, I have a pin prick. Um, so we have a receptor that picks up the stimulus through the sensory neuron, goes to the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, synapses with this um, interneuron. There's another interneuron, which goes to the motor neuron, which will then affect not only this uh, flexor muscle, but possibly another um, effector muscle as well. So I may have an interneuron tells two muscles to contract versus just one. The crossed extensor reflex is a contralateral reflex. If the withdrawal reflex is initiated, then the afferent sensory neuron synapses with interneurons and, con and causes contraction on the opposite extensor muscles. So here's where we have the pupillary light reflex, for instance. I shine a light or, or produce a stimulus in one eye it creates a response. We have a sensory neuron going to the spinal cord. Um, we have um, something going across the half of the spinal cord to the other side. Um, the other pupil will then constrict as well. Moderation of the reflexes. There is some moderation of the reflexes. The upper central nervous system produces kind of an inhibitory effect on the reflex arc. So if we have an injury that separates the central nervous system from that reflex arc, what will happen is that um, anything below that separation, if we have a reflex arc, they will become hyperreflexive. For instance, if I do a patellar um, reflex on you and you do a normal, just mild kick, okay, and then I sever your spinal cord above where th that would transfer up to the central nervous system. Um, so a couple of vertebrae up above where you have that reflex arc. Then you, uh, when I do the reflex, you will kick me much harder because your CNS is not inhibiting that at all. So trauma where the reflex arc enters and leaves the spinal cord or damage to the sensory nerve or motor nerve of that reflex refl results in either a hyporeflexive or absent reflex arc. This, is, this helps us to determine the location of the injury by checking the reflexes. So if you're hyperreflexive, then I know that the injury is above where the, uh, the reflex normally interfaces with the spinal cord. And we know that because we're going to know our anatomy and physiology. If the trauma occurs right where that sensory or motor nerve um, is at the reflex, right at the vertebrae, 
and we have a hypo reflex or absent reflex, that's where the injury is. So I can get within a couple of vertebrae of knowing where the injury is by knowing what the reflexes are of the animal. Some other things that we use pretty frequently. The palpebral reflex arc, which is when you do a light tap on the medial canthus. The, the, the medial canthus is the, um, the slit of the eye where the um, upper eyelid comes together with the lower eyelid. Uh, we're in that corner of the eye near the nose in the medial portion, and it produces a blink of the eye. So you, you lightly tap on that, and the eye should blink. There's also the pupillary light reflex, or PLR, which is a normal response to shining light in the eye of an animal, and the iris will constrict in both eyes. So do you remember if we shine a light in one eye and it crosses the body, what that is called? Contralateral reflex. Good job. All right, so... I want you to remember that you need to name the cranial nerves. You need to know what they do. Number one, olfactory nerve. It is sensory, does smell. Number two, the optic nerve. It is sensory, vision. Okay, so you need to go through all of those and be able to name them. Tell me what they do. Here are some other questions that you can do to test yourselves. Um, uh, in order to get ready for not only the quiz, but also understanding the rest of the body, pharmacology, all that kind of good thing. Let me read the, through these for you. Axons in the CNS are often covered by what? Cells that support neurons structurally and functionally are called what? The part of the nervous system that controls involuntary nervous system functions is the when you pet a dog, which receptors send a sensation from the skin? Which receptors send a sensation from the skin to the dog's brain? So I'm asking you, what is the sensory? Okay. The electrical difference in charges across a neuron neuron cell membrane. So that difference between charges is called what? And I want you to be able to describe what is happening during depolarization. What is happening in that cell membrane during repolarization? Define for me the relative refractory period. And from that, you might want to know what the absolute refractory period is. We want to know what acetylcholine, that neurotransmitter, is responsible for. I want you to know uh, what that commonly used antiparasitic that causes an increased inhibitory neurotransmitter effect is. I want you to know what norepinephrine is broken down by. There are two things. Remember that. The damage to this part, what part of the brain, can result in rapid death because it controls all these basic functions. The blood-brain barrier is found where? And, and what part, what structure of the brain uh, or, or blood system? Sensations from the gastrointestinal tract are provided by which nerve? It's a cranial nerve, just a hint. And you, you want to know the differences between the parasympathetic and sympathetic pre- and post-ganglionic neurons. I want you to know what increases a heart rate and force of contraction. Um, what, what are we stimulating to get that? Um, what is a somatic reflex arc? In the stretch reflex, there is a structure that is stretched and sends impulses via the somatic sensory neuron to the spinal cord. So I want you to go back to that picture and tell me what structure is within that muscle that stretches and creates that, that um, sensory input. What are the crossed extensor reflex? Um, what, is it contralateral or ipsilateral? What causes it? Is it a somatic reflex or is it an autonomic reflex? The reflex arc that is commonly used to assess the depth of anesthesia. Do you know what that is? I don't think I said it in this lecture. I'll tell you that. It's the palpebral reflex. You, you tap on the eyelid. Okay, so that gives you the depth of anesthesia. So palpebral reflex, that's the answer, right? involves which cranial nerves? Look at those. What controls those eyelids? The stretch reflex that involves, or the stretch reflex involves how many interneurons? What is or are type or names for adrenergic receptors? How many are there? What do they do? Um, what is increased with a fight or flight situation? What kind of neurotransmitters are increased? What kind of effect do those neurotransmitters have 
on the, on the parts of the body, what's increased, okay? What is a dorsal horn? What is that, what is that portion um, of the anatomy um, responsible for? What is cranial nerve three responsible? In, in uh, doing that, you should know all the cranial nerves. All right, if we have a barn kitty, and this is very common, that's walking around kind of drunken, has very uncoordinated movements, that means that they have a smaller what part of the brain. Okay, I want you to look into that. What happens at the nodes of Ron VA? Do you remember what the nodes of Ron VA are and what makes that special? What does it mean when you see a stronger than normal reflex or a hyper reflex? And then consequently, what does it mean? Or conversely, what does it mean when you see a decreased reflex? And that's something I just covered in the last couple of slides. So go back and listen or look at those. All right, so if you're able to answer those questions, that means that you've got a pretty good idea of what's going on with the nervous system. If you are not able to answer those questions, let's talk about specific questions when you come into class.